So we started off this morning at a very high policy level and migrated down to a more practical level. Now we're on the ground at the formal level. And our first speaker for this afternoon is the well-known Kubus Hartmann. He is from the Agri Business Systems International, a consultant, well-known in the industry for years, and he's going to tell us what is going to happen if we lose certain products in our market. And without further ado, Kubus, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. I think this thing works. Amazing to see how many people have returned after the lunch. I don't think there was any wine involved, which is a pity, of course, but nevertheless, it kept everyone awake. Hopefully, it will keep everyone awake. Most of you have li listened to most of what I'm going to say during the course of the next 30 minutes. <clears throat> but like a good lecturer, I think it is important that you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, and then you ask them what you told them. And I know most of you very well by the name, and I'm going to ask you afterwards what I said. So please listen carefully, please focus, and make sure you know and you understand what I'm going to say. When I walked onto the stage, I realized that I'm entering the so-called twilight zone of my professional career, and as such, uh, me and my contemporaries are rather hesitant to change, but not because we don't want to change, but merely because we don't like to change to something that is tainted with politics. And most of these deals that we are going to talk about, some of them are, are proposals, have got a taint of politics involved in there. What are these deals that we are talking about? First of all, the EU Green Deal, of course, we've heard a lot about the EU Green Deal, we've heard a lot and you will even hear much more from specialists in this regard. But then also, and something that is concerning me a lot, is the South African regulatory authorities and, uh, uh, aim to scrap the registration and the use of certain substances of concern. These are compounds classified as 1A, and I've put it in brackets, 1B, and I've done it specifically because this element of unclearness, of un, un, uh, lack of knowing exactly what is being meant by all of this. And this is all taken from the initial draft regulation that was published a few months ago by the registrar where he, where he gave his intention to scrap certain of these registrations. And then, of course, he also mentioned so-called substances identified by the Stockholm Convention, A, B, and D. That was according to the draft regulation. Subsequently, there was a letter that was shown by Sara, which indicated that he's also want to scrap some stuff under the... Um, under the uh, Rotterdam Convention, I think, Sarah, of the other one, the Montreal Convention, whatever conventions there was. N needless to say, when we look at these things, it is of great concern. Can we comply or can we not comply? I think Rod alluded to the IPM principles that are being followed by CropLife or that are being endorsed by CropLife. And Yes, in horticulture, and I would refer to the horticultural side of things mainly, in horticulture we've already adopted this whole concept of IPM many, many years ago. For those who have forgotten about it, just as a reminder, it has, this philosophy has a few specific aims in mind. First of all, it must pr support the production of class one fruit profitably. It's no use in producing a load of rubbish in the end of the day under the auspices or under the umbrella of IPM because it cannot sell. And if you don't sell, you, uh, you have quite a bit of a problem and Andre would, would uh, be able to explain to you if you don't know what that is. Secondly, it must create space and opportunity and I would like to be very specific about that. Create the space and the opportunity for natural enemies and biological control agents to proliferate and assist in not replace, but assist in the control of pest and diseases using conventional chemistry. And the ARs that I've used there is agricultural remedies, by the way. Furthermore, uh, the focus must be to develop local and site-specific beneficial organisms. I have a little bit of a problem with imported products that are being supplied from a bottle, with due respect. Another aim of IPM is, of course, the the uh, delay or the prevention of, the, of uh, resistance. That is most probably one of the main aims of IPM, is to prevent or delay resistance as such. 
we are running out of suitable alternatives or active ingredients much faster than we can replace them, and I think it was shown on some of the graphs this morning. The control strategies that we follow must be nice to the environment. In other words, agricultural remedies, when used judiciously, are not necessarily bad. They can assist and they can do a very good job, provided that you use them judiciously. ARs must be palatable, uh, uh, must have a palatable mammalian toxicity profile. Humans can run and hide, but naturals cannot hide. Furthermore, I would emphasize the ideal crop protection strategy. What does it look like, bearing in mind what we just heard about IPM? It must therefore be effective. It must follow an acknowledged science-based approach for diagnosis and prescription. Chosen compounds must have a short but functional decline life or decline curve. It must be site-specific or target-specific. It must be safe to the biotic and, I and abiotic environment, and there must be plenty of alternatives available, otherwise we cannot uh, uh, protect resistance development that, are, that, are or that has the same efficacy on the, on the target, but with different modes of action. Yeah, I just realized that I'm using the computer and not and not your clicker. Is it fine? Have you managed to, to bridge that gap? Thank you very much for intelligent people. Okay. The, um, okay, back to the, the ideal crop protection strategy. Compounds and strategies must be safe to the crop, of course. It's also no good to spray chemistry and fix the, the problem, but you increase the, the you, you destroy the crop. It must comply with legal standards of the country of origin, therefore it must be registered, and it must be used within the GAP set by the country of origin, or set by the label. It must comply with the requirements of the local and international buyers, so your crop protection strategy must be in, harmoni in harmony with what the buyer wants eventually. And I'm mentioning this, and as Alan was alluding earlier, there's a, there's a level of logic involved in what I want to say, because I'm moving towards an, uh, the, the practical impact of some of these chemicals that we have, and you will see that there are conflict with regards to these issues that we've just said, said to each other and most probably agreed about. Okay, before we go any further, I think it is important to just mention that we do not know what exactly gave rise to the decision of the registrar and what all the reasons are for the decisions that have been taken. It is also unclear which products are to be phased out. I think Sarah alluded to that when she said, we are still in the process of trying to find out which products are con of our concern. Whether the registrar is going to accept the motivation for extended use is also unclear to us, but we are trying. We're going to spend a lot of time putting forward alternatives or debates as to why a certain compound should stay and others cannot, do not have to stay, and whether that will be acceptable or not, we don't know. We also do not know whether it will allow for the quicker and timeless registration of alternatives, if they are available. We are also not certain that there will be available replacements for these pro products that we lose. And when we lose them, we don't have time to replace them. It must be done immediately. It must be done very short, on a very short notice. So most probably it would entail changes in the law to allow the registrar to act quickly and react to the losses of chemistry that we have. And we do not know which compounds can replace the ones that we've lost. Sarah has said she's not going to show you any of uh, the compounds from the list. That's a secret to the group. Unfortunately, I'm not bound by the secrets of the group, so I'm going to show you. And if I, there are 22 products, and if I count one, two, three, four, five, six columns, I'm going to, that means 22, 22 times six, it's something in the vicinity of more than 100. So I'm going to address each and every one of those cells individually and speak about it. I don't care about the time that Gerrit is going to limit it to. No. What I've done is I've taken six prom, uh, products from the list which we think is essential for use in horticulture. And I'm going to discuss, I'm going to mention you the six products by name, and I'm going to discuss two of them 
in a little bit more detail, so I'm going to spare you a lot of uh, trouble having to listen to 100 plus cells. First of all, it's dimethamorph, mancuzep, propiconazole. Those are three substances which we regard as very important in horticulture. But dimethamorph R1B, reproductive toxin 1B, mancuzep, reproductive toxin 1B, prop propiconazole, deep, uh, reproductive toxin 1B. Dimethamorph, I think, is essential for using table grapes for the control of downy mildew, and the only replacement that we have in the slot in which dimethoate fits is copper salts. Copper salts are fine, but they have a, a potential phytotoxic risk for the table grapes. In other words, it would conflict with one of these elements of ideal crop protection strategies that I've already mentioned. As far as the IPM resist, uh, rating is concerned, we regard dimethamorph as fairly fine. Mancuzep, stone fruit, gum spot, and leaf, sp uh, and, and leaf rust, those are two diseases for which we do not have an alternative at the moment. In the case of pears, we use mancozep to a large extent for the control of septoria leaf rust. We could most probably uh, use captan as an alternative. Unfortunately, captan is not registered for any of those diseases, so it is a potential problem, unless we want to violate the law, of course. Then the IPM, friendly, uh, the IPM rating of, of mancozep is not that great. It has an impact on natural enemies for mites and mite predators. So if we put that by the wayside, it is an important product at the moment for those two areas. There are many other areas where it's nice to have, but what, where it's not essential. But in this case, we do not have alternatives. Propiconazole, uh, it is a R1B. It's in stone fruit, where we need it for the simultaneous control of blossom blight and powdery mildew. There are many products that we can use, or there are other products that we can use for powdery mildew, and other that we can use for, for, for uh, blossom blight. But there's not a single one that can be used simultaneously that are registered, which we can use for the purpose in which propiconazole fits. And then the last three that I would like to mention to you, thiocloprid, mineral oil, and glufosinate ammonium. Unfortunately, for those who are not familiar with the names and the products, you'll have to bear with us for, the, for a little while. Thiocloprid fits in very nicely in palm fruit as the first entrance in the codling moth control strategy. There are alternatives, and I will talk about that later because I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on thiocloprid. Uh, the problem is that the alternatives have a resistant risk for, specifically for the diamides and, and the mectins, and some of them are not very effective or have long-term effects or ha doesn't have the legs to really fit into a strategy. Mineral oil, we need them with all crops, either as a dormancy breaking agent or as an adjuvant. And at the moment, we don't have alternatives for mineral oils. The problem with mineral oils are most probably some of the co-formulants or not co-formulants, some of the contaminants in there, which I believe from the, from the registration holders can be removed. So we might be able to revive mineral oil and that would be a great achievement. Then glufosinate ammonium is hardly, it's just about the only scorching agent which we can use on young trees that has a fairly acceptable environmental profile barring the fact that it's a reproductive toxin 1B. The alternatives are glyphosate and, and uh, paraquat and all of you would know what the concerns of the international markets are towards glyphosate and paraquat. Let's have a little bit more detailed look at the two of those six chemicals that I've mentioned, which we regard as essential. First of all, just bear in mind that all of them are 1Bs. So if we decide not to cancel the registration of the Bs, we have no debate further. It's easy. But if the Bs are on the list, uh, we will have a problem with the flowers by way of speaking. The active ingredients are all 1Bs, as I said, or this active ingredient. It's used for late season control of downy mildew and table grapes, past the five millimeter berry diameter stage. It's used in mixtures to support the efficacy of other active ingredients, such as amitoctradine, folpet, mancuzet, those chemicals are absolutely essential for, for late season control 
of downy mildew, with the exception of Folpet in Moncozep, which cannot be used post the 5 mm barrier diameter because you have a problem with visible residues on table grapes, making the crop useless for, for marketing. So we are left with only one alternative, and that is a mixture of amatoctrodine and, and dimethomorph, for which we have no alternative at the moment. Yes, there's a possibility of using, a, a, what is this thing called, a, Curzate Pro, or not Curzate Pro, Equation Pro, which is a mixture of Famoxidone and Cymoxanol. The problem with that is that Famoxidone is also strike, struggling for survival, and the label limits you to 5 mm buried diameter spray unless you want to ignore the gap, which will put you in the arena of illegality and the gangsters. The alternative control measures are limited to 5 mm buried diameter, and I said there's a phytoxic, the phytotoxic risk for the copper compounds that could be used instead. This is just an example of how the, what, the, uh, what the feature of the international markets are with regard to this specific chemical. If you look at the right-hand side of the column, you can't see much of it, but if you look at the right-hand side of the, of the little strip that I've got in there, you'll see most of it is green or yellow, which indicates that the markets don't have a real concern with it. It's acceptable chemical to the markets. So we can cross that bridge, but we have a problem with our own registration. The second one is thiocloprid. The compounds fit well into the first generation of Codling Mod Control Strategy maybe the first spray after blossom. The early use of a single application will not leave residues if it is used in that regard. The manufacturer indicated that 100 days is enough to allow for total dissipation. 100 days pre-harvest pre interval is enough for total dissipation. And that's all we need. Once we can bridge that gap, we can use the product for codling moth control without any problems. Let's have a look at the alternatives. There are two diamides that could be used, cyantronilipril chlor and chlorantronilipril. Excellent products to be used. The problem is they have got a high risk for resistance. And if we overuse them, we have a problem with, uh, with obviously, we can lose two of the best compounds that we have available. Emomectin is a possibility, but emomectin is a, has got very short legs can fit in there, but it has also got a problem with residues, and we try to, or not really residues, because it's limited at 0 0.01, but with the necessary derogations and support behind imomectin, we can use that as an alternative for thiocloprid. Gerard, your body language hopefully is not expressing anything with regards to time. Then, the spinosins are there, but we would prefer to use them later in the season. The pyrethroids, I think, has got an acknowledged resistant level or resistant profile, and we would rather refrain from doing, using that, that instead of the thiocloprids. If you look at the market requirements again, you can do that clicking, thank you. If you look at the market requirements again, you will see it's yellows and orange. As long as it's not red and black, it's fine. The markets can tolerate. So markets can tolerate it, but we can't tolerate it. What are the impacts, of the impact of the previous slides. We have seen some highly, or we've highlighted some challenges facing production of deciduous fruit caused by these deals. Further challenges are so-called, which I would like to refer to as regulatory imperialism imposed by the regulators internationally, particularly the EU, and the proposed, or amongst others, the proposed minor clause or the mirror clause of the EU. Then further, MRL reductions by the EU is, a possible, is possible, and there could be reciprocation in that regard. Then there's also com commercial imperialism due to pseudo-scientific limitations of ARFDs, proportionate MRLs, the number of residues, and the blacklisting of certain compounds imposed by buyers and driven by pressure groups such as consumer watchdogs. If you just have a look at, the, at this commercial compound, most of you have seen this, but just look at the German supermarkets, the requirements set by them with regards to MRLs, the summary of the sum of MRLs, the level of the MRLs, the maximum ARD, ARFD levels, and look at how it changes. Don't bother about the, the uh, up the this, this superscript and the, and the D. Just look at the figures and see how it changes between the markets. There's a big inconsistency, inconsistency between the different. They're all selling to the same Germans, and uh, j maybe just in, and even in the same town. But in the end of the day, they regard themselves as whiter than driven snow from time to time. 
Looking back, there are more of them, Metro, Nitu, Norma, Rieva, Tigot. You can see the big variation between the different supermarkets. If that is not enough, look at the effect of a channel between two countries, small area of the island and the, con and the continent. UK traders doesn't bother too much. They allow you 100% of the EU MRL. They have no problem with the percentage of the ARFD. They have no restrictions on the sum total of the MRL or the ARFD per sample. The quite the contrary is true for the European supermarkets, in particular the German supermarkets. And there are more of those things which I will not dwell on. If you look at this, for instance, look at the various restrictions of different compounds in the EU. This is just a list of the compounds to the left. And if you look at Aldi, Kaufland, Rewe, Lidl, Norma, Tesco, Global Fruit, uh, the Global Fruit Point is an importer on, on behalf of a number of supermarkets. You can see all the red areas in there which are prohibited chemicals. And again, uh, inconsistency between the different buyers. Okay, what can we expect in future as, as a result of these so-called deals? I think, and this is purely initiative of my own, crop losses due to limited ability of, for, of, of, and the use of active compounds, smaller and less sustainable toolbox will result or could result in, in serious crop losses. Obviously, there's a limited uh, ability to control quarantine pests and diseases to a level of zero tolerance. Remember that a quarantine pest doesn't have a low tolerance, it has a zero tolerance. And to be able to do that almost takes more energy for the last 5% of control than for the first 95% of control. We might have a problem with secondary pests and new pests developing as a result of this. And then, of course, we'll have a problem with pest migrations. There are a lot of new pests coming into the country and which we need control measures for. A big issue with me is the generation of waste. If we fail at the number of residues internationally, or if we fail at the cosmetic compliance of the product, we waste the product. And I've seen numerous cases of growers throwing excellent quality lemons last year away. They couldn't even process them because there was oversupply in the processors because of the fact that it didn't fit one or other supermarket grill of gier. What can we expect in the future of the result of these deals? We've already started with that. We can expect monopolies in agriculture remedy marketing. If one company has the only product available in the market and he decides to sell it exclusively through a number of his agents, we will have a problem with the price and the monopolies concerned with that. We can expect a proliferation of biologic and bioregional pro biorational products and solutions, which is a good thing, but to a limit, to a point because some of these products has got a limited performance. And I'm being, I've been put on record to, that I've said many of them work well when there's not a problem. Furthermore, we can expect international food, proce food processors enforcing international standards on non-export crops like wheat, barley, canola. Pioneer buys a lot of wheat. Uh, Heineken has just bought uh, one of our biggest wine sellers, Farmer's Winery. Do you think Heineken will go by the South African law or will it go by the Dutch law when it comes to residues and the, residue, uh, and the, and the restrictions imposed on barley that are being malted in Caledon? They will go by the international standards and they will be bound by the international standards. And in the end of the day, and the same will account for, for wine grapes, which up till now was almost sort of free of all these regulatory details. All of this, to my mind, could contribute and will generate food insecurity and does not support the whole aim of our international view on having more food available for a growing community. I believe the 8 million baby was born last week. The problem is not fossil fuel, it's most probably the relationship between male and females. What do we think? will be the solution to all of this. I don't know what the solution would be, but we need new thinking. If 
we, uh, we need effective and enabling regulatory process that are agile and supportive to all. In other words, our, in, our regulatory in authorities must be enabling, not uh, uh, regulating, but enabling. We need high-level and sound research in crop protection that can supply workable information to solve the issues of crop protection within the borders of IPM. Science must prevail. We have heard that this morning. Not pseudoscience, not perceptions. Science must prevail. We need a new focus on soil health and root management. I often say that we farm roots, we sell fruit, and we neglect the bit under, under the soil too often. We need properly trained and skilled crop protection practitioners. Not necessarily with due, with due respect, ladies and gentlemen, salesmen. We need crop protection practitioners that can ensure that South African agriculture stays in business. And this is most probably one of the most important bits as far as I'm concerned. We need harmonious, continuous harmonious relationships and discussions between the authorities, organized agriculture, and the trade to solve challenges quickly and cost efficiently. Pseudoscience, red tape, egos, would, is bound to kill our agriculture and cause irreparable damage to the economy and food safety. I want to conclude with a statement made by a great orator many years ago, and almost to the day, 80 years ago, where he said, this is not the end. Maybe this is not even the beginning of the end, but maybe this is the end of the beginning. And it was Winston Churchill who said that, 10th November 1942. I think to a large extent it would apply to us as well. This could be the beginning or the end of the, the beginning of the end. No, it could be rather the beginning. Let's leave it to Churchill to dwell with that. Thank you very much, Gerard. And Jeff. <laughs> Thank you very much, Quibus. Like always, straight from the hip with a 44 Magnum in between the eyes. No beating about the bush. Um, I listened to Quibus, and the one thing came to mind is if you take that commodity out of the market, I want to give you the analogy between motor vehicles. If you say tomorrow, we are not going to allow anybody to owe, own a 4x4, four four, no problem. You can buy a passenger car. But what are the multiple um, challenges coming up if you have to go to a place like the Bavianse Kloof, close to me, up the mountains here with a normal little Renault Quid? Sorry for the marketing of the, of the brand. So what Kuba has explained here is if you take a combat other market, you open up this plethora or a matrix of challenges because you cannot just take somebody else or something else and fit it in behind Mangozip or something behind Cyclo because there are a lot of different elements that they meet the match up to make sure it can do exactly what is required in terms of technology and also in terms of regulatory to fit into that slot. So, Kubus, thank you very much for that. And before I hand over to, to, um, to Paul Hartman from the Citrus Growers Association, the word came up again in Kubus, like this morning, food insecurity. Okay? We talk about the Green Deal, going greener, safer food, environmental protection, food is what's going to make the world go round or bring the world to an end. So we're going to move on to our last speaker for the day before we have our panel discussion. Um, Paul Hardman from the Citrus Growers Industry. He's the Industry Affairs Manager. And we're now at the real grassroots level. So in other words, what is, it going to, what is going to happen to the grower himself or herself on the ground if we don't basically work ourselves into the Green Deal and change the mindset and change the parameters. Paul, thank you. Thanks, uh, Gerrit, and uh, thanks for the, the, the conference organizers. It's, it's actually been a very stimulating uh, morning and day so far, and uh, thank, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, there's actually not a great deal that I can um, re really add in terms of the principles, other than to share what we're experiencing in, in the citrus industry. So as, as Gerrit said, just a, a sense of what's happening on, on, on the ground. Um, when it comes to how these policies are actually getting uh, uh, rolled out. Um, 
Yeah, so just really my, th my sort of plan is, is just to share how, how the, the world trade has changed um, because we need to see it in that context um, and then just obviously just go through a lot of the, a lot of the detail that, that uh, um, people have already shared. I'm not going to go into, into that again, but just reflecting on that, how it impacts on the citrus industry and, and what do we see uh, the future looking like in that sense. Just a, 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 a cautionary note here, um, I have been uh, some... some Speak, uh, talks I've done before, people told me I came across as uh, not, not really being that uh, sympathetic to, to climate change and, and really needing to pursue uh, sustainability topics. Um, I can tell you uh, that that's contrary to, to what I believe fundamentally, but, but also what we're actually trying to do. The, the point is, and, and, and it was highlighted, the Green Deal is, is, a, is a political statement, really, more than it is about actual what happens on the ground. And I think there's a massive gap that has developed between what's, what's happening at a political economic level and, and real true sustainability uh, movement. And you can see the complexity and, and why it's difficult to, to bridge this gap when you think of, 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 of the slow progress that's coming out of the, the COP type uh, discussions. You know, it's taken years and years to actually get to real tangible movement on sustainability because it's, it's influenced by, by politics and, and trade. So that, that uh, cautionary note. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is really the starting point for me when I started to think about this is a process that I went through in about 2008 when um, we, we got a letter out of, out of Russia to indicate that the, the Russians requested the Department of Agriculture at that time to, to sign off on a letter regarding uh, MRLs. Um, and I, I was duly sent off to Moscow to, to find out what basically what the hell's going on there um, and, and why, why this letter sort of popped out of the blue. And so we found ourselves in this state room with a delegation of the Russians on that side and our South African delegation and we, we started to interact. We, we put forward what, what, what did this letter mean? And we were working with a, a local translator and so the discussion went, went to, to and fro. We, we asked them initially what it was about. And, uh, then they proceeded for about 20 minutes to, do, to indicate what, they were, what, what this letter meant. And they would sort of talk for a minute or two and our translator would, would respond. And over the course of the time, it just became so apparent how this whole picture fitted together. We, we initially went there thinking we'd just been caught in the crossfire, there's been a mistake, there's been, been some... But we realized after going through that process that the, the Russian authorities there had, had put this, this whole mechanism together to create an unbelievably powerful lever um, to influence uh, trade. And the background story to that was that was just about the time when the Russians were trying to enter the WTO and trying to exert some influence, political influence, over that process. And yes, we were being caught in the crossfire. And, and some of the reality of this is that the, the Russians themselves, uh, sorry, the Europeans themselves were, were part, of, part of the target of that, and, and it really hurt European producers. They lost millions of rand, and, and that trade basically stopped almost instantly with, with Russia. Um, the, the, the point I'm simply trying to make is that in this mix of mixing the, the science and the, the, the trade dynamics around MRLs, which were, were very well explained this morning, and, and the economics and politics, is that you, you have a very powerful tool. And this is, this is part of my concern a little bit with, with the, the, the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. It's, it's a very powerful tool. Um, and hopefully I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the intent, because really at the heart of it, we have to understand what are they trying to do? Is it about sustainability, true sustainability, or are we going to get caught up in some of this, this other aspect um, of, of economics and politics, uh, which will really hurt us potentially? Um, obviously, people have spoken about this a lot, a lot this morning in terms of the uh, association between the farm to fork strategy and the, the cap. Uh, the common agricultural policy. Just to add a few numbers to that, it's, it's worth about 387 billion, this, this current cap, which runs until 2027, which works out about 6.4 million rand. So that means out of the taxpayer's pocket, every year European farmers are going to get uh, two and a bit times the South African GDP. 
That's the, the quantum of funds that are being purely pumped into, into the farmers' pockets, and it's, it's, it's completely bypassing the price-setting mechanism for, for commodities. So in other words, they, it doesn't matter how much they produce, they, they still get the, the subsidy. Um, and, and obviously that, that obviously has, has traded, you know, it's not the free market uh, um, sort of view. Also coming from an agricultural economist point of view, so another one up here uh, at the moment, but the, you're obviously not allocating resources then efficiently because there's a, there's a skewing of um, re, uh, sort of funds getting channeled back, back to farmers. The other really significant thing about the, the cap that's been implemented this, in this round is that it is very closely associated with the, with the Green Deal and farm to fork uh, requirements in terms of lower pesticides, lower inputs from fertilizer, etc. So what we're seeing currently, and there's been the odd demonstration already from, from European growers, they, they're struggling to actually meet these targets themselves um, and access those, those subsidies, so their, their on-farm incomes are also getting impacted uh, by this. So just getting a bit closer to, to how we see sort of things panning out and how in the citrus industry we're observing the, the farm-to-fork strategy. The, the, the problem Gerrit, with taking it from a policy level to what we actually think will happen on the ground, the, the challenge with that is it's, it's an inco incoherent policy um, in the sense that it has been influenced by the politics and economics and it's not just about the science. So if we look at some of those, those objectives around reducing uh, plant protection products, well, Potentially, that's directly opposed to, to market access and trade. Now, remember, Europe's own trade has expanded significantly, I mean, exporting as well. So if we're talking um, reciprocating, I mean, they, that, that's a massive aspect that they need to take uh, um, into account. Their ability to actually access other markets is also going to be uh, influenced. You then look at what the impact would be on waste, and, and Kubis has touched on that. You know, we've got this, that dynamic, an increase in waste, um, and that's the quickest way to actually increase your, your impact on the environment if you, if you have high levels of waste. Obviously, it links to um, improvement, well, improved incomes. Um, obviously, that getting tainted. So if you're not, if you're not delivering that high-quality product Kubis was talking about, it has impact on incomes. Um, obviously, there's the food safety aspect, and that, I mean, it just goes on. What the point I'm trying to raise here is that the, all these aspects are actually potentially pulling in different directions. Um, and from a, a, a practitioner's point of view, it's really difficult to see where the end goal is going to be, which force is actually going to predominate and prevail and, and put you in a position where, where you know where you're going to land. I mean, um, as, I mean some... Some sectors, for example, um, the citrus industry, quite a long time ago, took decisions about how to protect fruit um, post-harvest. So our, our strategy, this is going back even as early as the 90s, was to use post-harvest treatments, um, the, the typical uh, chemicals that we have in pack houses today, and rely less on packaging material to, to do that. Look, it, it does depend on, obviously, the, the type of product that you're dealing with, but that, that was a strategic decision many years ago. It means we're in a better position, perhaps now from a circular economy point of view, but there's still this massive pressure uh, uh, to, to do it. So, it's, yeah, I mean, th that's, those are long-term type decisions um, which could be disrupted now just because of these, the, these immediate goals coming through with, with the farm-to-fork strategy. But it, it's really challenging trying to predict exactly where the future will be with all this uncertainty. So the, the points have been made. This is just another sort of emphasis on it. it the Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy is very much influenced by, by uh, politics. Um, and this side just shows you the percentage of green parties that are, are essentially um, ruling um, member states. Um, and this is probably not, not even the full, full picture in the sense that coalitions and other parties um, are are influencing the decisions at a member state level. Um, and this is obviously what the, what the consumer wants, the, the population, so that, that we understand. We don't have any objections to it, but it, it does mean a green economy is, is, is forming part of the political thinking. Um, again, to make the point, the, the issues aren't so much the, the Green Deal or the Farm to, uh, to Fork strategy, if it's, if it's good um, science and good 
you know, the, the objectives are, are noble. It's, it's when the, the political aspect gets in, into play. And so what we have now is basically we're living through the consequence of, of decisions taken a number of years ago. And L Lindy referred to this in terms of the current regulations around um, you know, pesticide authorization um, and MRL setting. The, within the last uh, decade, the a process of MRL setting or the formalization of it now takes a political step. It has to go to be parli to Parliament be, uh, to be ratified. And that, that was actually a fundamental shift in the way uh, regulations were determined in, in Europe. And we can see that now where, where, again, politics are deliberately having an influence over the final outcomes. It's not just science-based, it's not just the technocrats uh, dealing with it, it's, it's, it's the politicians also making uh, their, having their influence. Um, this was an interesting article that came out not so long ago. It's, it was uh, labeled, this is on the, the European uh, Parliament website, uh, pesticides in food, what, what is the European Parliament doing to help? Okay, um, how do you understand that statement? What do you think the article is about? Do you think it's there to help the producer? Or the consumer? Get, get lower residues, more residues? Um, lower use of, of crop protection products? But it, it goes on, obviously, to talk a little bit about details of what they're trying to do, and it, it is obviously in line with the strategies of, of the Farm to Forks uh, strategy of, of reducing the amount of um, active ingredients that are, are used. Um, and they throw in what, what I think, um, you know, like a statement, it's, it's, but they're doing this because of potentially the renewal of actives like uh, a glass effect. Now, I'm not making any judgments on active substances here, but it's, it just tells you how involved the politicians are on, on, the, on a very technical and uh, scientific topic. Um, just just inter interestingly there, if you look at that second uh, paragraph, I'll, I'll turn to now, the sustainable use of pesticides, they do refer to integrated pest management. Now, if they were following it exactly how Kubis was saying, I can't see how they can have that, that broader statement, what are, what are we using, what, what is the parliament doing to, to help, if they're meaning just simply lower residues. Um, yeah. Um, what was also interesting, obviously, um, Yeah, um, this is just another slide, just talking about how, how they're essentially going, going to the member state level. So what, what they were finding with, with this, basically the, the, the substitution principle that, that they've applied here is at, at the European level, they'd, they'd obviously agreed to, to make some um, commitments to lower pesticide use and push that down to member state level to actually implement. Um, that was the... Um, the sustainable use of pesticide uh, regulation, which came in about 2009 as well. Practically for 10 years, there's been not a great deal of progress on that regulation, and it's just being reviewed now, and the policy um, review is ha happening now. The, the point is, um, and, th and this is here, the, 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 the findings of this impact assessment is that member states themselves are really struggling to comply with with, with, with the expectation of lower residues. Again, this is the anomaly and paradox that comes in. You've got all these opposing forces. Yes, it's a good idea, but, but what actually happens on the ground? And that makes it really tricky to be a third country trying to predict uh, where, to, where to go. So what, does, what can we understand from re uh, reciprocation? What does that mean? Is it a like-for-like like in the sense that you, you're simply trading off ideas, that if, if, you, if Europe makes a, a, sets a target for 50% lower residue, does that mean we've got to do the same? Is, is that exactly how it works? Or are we going to be trying to pursue more traditional ways of, of negotiating trade where, where yes, you, you might want to see um, give and take on both sides, but it's not, it's not a perfect uh, match, um, and obviously, when it comes to things like integrated pest management, which is site-specific, pest and disease-specific, um, you, you can't be doing an exact match. It simply doesn't work. And, and that's, that's why um, the, the argument that if, if, if it's not authorised in Europe um, means countries outside of Europe can't use it, that, that argument, it, it falls flat um, if, um, if you really take IPM uh, seriously.
Okay, just, just getting a little bit onto where we see the, the challenges with um, if we were to reciprocate an exact like-for-like like situation. Obviously, increased organic is, is in the citrus industry is, is almost impossible, mainly because of the number one challenge, and I emphasize it again, raised by my <coughs> colleague over there, Sean Moore, it's the phytosanitary requirements. If you want to access the market from a phytosanitary point of view, you, you, you have to control that uh, particular disease or pest, and, and hence you have to have the control options. Um, it, is, it is our number one uh, challenge, and unfortunately, uh, um, started out as an optimist and uh, have a little bit more experience now when it comes to, to some of the phytosanitary uh, dynamics at play, but, but sometimes yeah, the facts just don't carry, carry weight, and uh, it's not that they're not reliable or good, in fact, to the contrary, but they, they are, are pushed aside or, or, or ignored, um, and, and that's a problem for us. I mean, and that's, that's part of the challenge in terms of what we need to think about in terms of our messaging and, and getting to the right ears. Um, obviously, re reduction in the use of, of synthetic inputs, maybe fertilizers may or may not, uh, uh, you know, we could, could cope with that, but again, um, it, it's linked to, to proper tree health, which, which Corbus has, has raised. Um, you know, when, when, when we look at the reduction of, of hazardous pesticides, again, which, which member state do you actually follow? Um, because even, and I'll come back to sort of maybe organic, if you look at the rate of uptake of organic even within member states, it varies significantly. So when you reciprocate, who, who are you trying to follow there? Yes, they've got targets, but, but if you, are, are we looking for actual, actual um, uh, reciprocation in terms of matching them uh, to what they can achieve, or, or is it, are they expecting us to be even higher than that in terms of their, their ideal goals? Um, I mentioned on the circular common, uh, economy different strategies for, for packaging material. Unfortunately, in the citrus industry, that, that's uh, not such a big challenge for us, but obviously on the carbon border adjustment mechanism, we're watching that, that very closely. And that does go back w where you really need good, good science. Fortunately, in, this, in the fruit industry, we've got the Confronting Climate Change um, project, and that's, that's looking at that very closely to tr try and prepare our industry for um, that aspect, as well as the, the local carbon tax uh, requirements. And then obviously looking at uh, reducing uh, biodiversity, again that's, that, that may or may not be a challenge for us depending on how they, they're looking at uh, reducing it. Okay, just looking at some of the uncertainties and, and trying to just flesh that out, um, again I've, I've pointed out the, the pesticide Pests are candidates for substitution. We haven't really seen even the European member states making great progress there. Are they pushing us hard to, to, to take that, that out? Um, the, uh, and I said, well, you know, which, which member states are, are we expected to follow? Because there is quite a lot of uh, variation in how, they, how they're approaching it. In terms of um, one, one thing that, that we've started within the, uh, the citrus industry is um, there's, there's actually two two institutions that we've linked up. The, the, the one that we've started internally is the Citrus Sustainability Forum. We started at the beginning of last year, and, and that's the platform where we're trying to, to get as many stakeholders together to talk about these issues and try to prepare for, the, for that future. Um, the, the other one I've been involved with is, is the Southern Hemisphere Association of Fresh Fruit Exporters. They've got a, a sustainability task group. Um, and, and SHAFE is made up of uh, our Southern Hemisphere um, counterparts, that's Peru, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and we, we, we're trying to interpret these new requirements coming out of Europe and what it will mean for, for the Southern Hemisphere. So there's definitely anecdotal stories and, and, and some facts in terms of how we, how we respond, um, and it could tie in very closely with, with the work being done by, by CropLife. What, what was interesting is being part of that process is just how we define sustainability and what it actually means from a cultural uh, and, and society point of view. I mean, obviously the impact of trade for communities living in rural areas. It was a theme that came through very strongly from, from that process. Um, and obviously the, the, there's an aspect that, um, you, you know, you can't, can't impose um, things from outside the country, especially if it, there's a very different context um, and, 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 and climate uh, in that space. So the, the point is, um, 
we, we ha we, we, we're dealing with different issues, um, and to try to have a one-size-fits-all just simply uh, doesn't work. Evidence-based decisions, um, of course, going back to the climate sort of, uh, and carbon um, trading, that type of aspect, and, and how we need to make progress in, in that, but you need good science, um, and, and the jury's still out in some of those, those areas. If, if the, Europe is only going to use EFSA as the only source um, of information, then we will have some challenges, um, definitely. We've seen that on the phytosanitary side, that you, know, you can have signs from both, both angles, um, and if they're only going to be, be predominantly using the one, that, that's problematic. And then, obviously, one of the other stated goals in the Farm to Fork strategy is, is, is improving environmental standards. Um, that's immediately obviously assuming that the European ones are, are perhaps better. Um, and, and what we found at a very practical level through CESA and, and some of the other standards that we've had to roll out is that when you, uh, you know, try and pose that from, from Europe, it's not that uh, relevant at times and not, uh, not that applicable. So it, it's a negotiation. It needs to be, be, be shared, that, that type of um, work, especially when it comes to how you uh, demonstrate it or, or, or create the transparency in the system, and that's where the costs lie. Some of, some of the models that have been adopted in Europe are very expensive, and that actually gets in the way of people doing the right thing um, on, on farms. Okay, so just kind of in, in summary and, and sort of getting to some of the real challenges, um, it, it is very difficult to see what, what the future looks like. I mean, in terms of what we're discussing in our sustainability forum, we've got different topics there, but we, we, we tend to be finding ourselves waiting for the next step, the, the, the latest indication out of Europe, exactly how do they interpret or how do they see it happening. So as much as we're trying to prepare for it, it it's, it's very difficult while there's, there's uncertainty. Um, the other thing that was mentioned this morning, and, and, and Lindy has is, is sort of also raised, I mean, we, we do need to find mechanisms where we can have proper inputs into the processes. It does feel like the, the European Union has decided already and now is sort of pushing that out, whereas it would have been much better if there was, was some form of engagement before then. We can really get into the detail and, and then come up with a, a joint solution. A bit like uh, Prof. Eustace's policy thing. I mean, that, that would have been great if we had we would had that opportunity earlier. Um, it was also mentioned we've had got very little financial resources. I mean, many industries are on their knees right now, and, and there's just, unfortunately, environmental and social type work doesn't happen very quickly when there's no extra money to, to work on that. So, uh, you know, from a genuine um, s sustainability point of view, environmental sustainability, we, we're quite concerned about that. Um, and has also been highlighted, the next phase is, is, is really now bolting on these requirements. So if I go back, go back to that, that, um, that, that Russian example that I, where I started with, essentially what, what the Russians were looking to do was get the Department of Agriculture to sign that memorandum of understanding. So they were, they were reducing their intentions to, a, to an agreement which has to be signed. And basically you, like, there was little choice, you, you had to sign that agreement. And, and, and everybody basically did. The, the problem was they had very few MRLs at the time, so, so you were almost admitting that, that you were going to struggle. It puts you in a very difficult uh, uh, position. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the, the reality of kind of where we find ourselves in now. We're almost being compelled to, to sign up to this, something, this agreement we, we, we've, we've never really um, had a chance to influence. And uh, that's, that's, I think, what, what the, the, the reality we're facing now um, on the ground and uh, in the citrus industry. Thanks, Scott. That's just a final thing from Cape Town. So obviously we've, we've crossed the globe from Ru uh, Russia to um, Brussels to, to Cape Town. And uh, yeah, I just want to co confirm the, the points being made in terms of we do need to communicate, cooperate, um, and have genuine concern uh, for, for sustainability topics. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to sit down um, and not jump up to the podium again because we're starting our panel discussion. And um, before I invite the panelists to respond to certain topics which I've identified, um, just a couple of my own takeaway thoughts from Paul's presentation. First of all, the policy, that farm to fork policy, seems to be nebulous. We don't know what the 
what drives that particular policy. And if you don't know what drives the policy, how can you respond to the policy? Second thing that we heard throughout today's um, discussion is um, this idea of the mirror clauses. If I do this, you've got to do that as well. And I had a talk on radio last night about genetics and stuff. Not that I know anything about it, but I told people that around the world, people all look differently. Even the audience today would look differently. And my, to latch on to what Paul says, different cultures, different modes of operation, different habits. And how can you then get the European Union to tell us that you must do this and that. It, it ain't going to work in my book. Um, the carbon emission story that, that gets latched onto this whole EU Green Deal, and I hear the word carbon tax, I get jittery because what happens to the carbon tax? What is the carbon tax used for? It's not just a way to, to harness more money, to go into the pockets of whatever they want to do with the money. And maybe the most important one is they talk about the evidence. What is your reference frame for the evidence. Is it ECPA? Is it EFSA? Is it the EPA? Is it a Far Eastern model? So, and there's so many different things. I learned in science in my younger days that science is always about challenging the evidence. In other words, there's never evidence which stands for eternity. If you look at the modern things about space and so on, there's a strong case now to be made out that the Einsteinian type of theories f for the space are no longer valid. So we cannot just say there's ECPA, and that is the base to work from because you can always challenge the science. So the scientific data, we don't know what is the, the starting point for that. And very worrying that we heard throughout today as well is a lot of the stuff is not science driven, it's politically driven, and they latch it then onto the trade agreements and the trade preferences, and that causes havoc on the market. So without going further into my little takes on what happened there, um, we decided to have a panel discussion and to flesh out about more what was discussed, especially in our latest session this, or our last session this afternoon. And um, on the panel, we invited not just people, specialists, to, can, to, to talk to us and address these particular issues. And on my left hand side, Dr. Elme Kutzeburgma, that we've always welcomed to our meetings in Crop Life SA from Global Gap, which is, from a personal perspective, still the certification body in the world. You heard Paul now. You've heard Kubas Hartmann, Dundi Benik from Walkro, that is the sort of market access person for the farmers into any part of the world. And we also have Skalk Skuman. Is Skalk online, Elriza? Dr. Skalk Skuman, he's from the South African Macadamia Producer Organization, a person that also works very much on the ground level with the producer and guiding the producer to make sure they produce their macadamias in order to be able to export to other destinations in the world. And these are the specialists we wanted to bring on board today to discuss certain topics, especially lower down, away from the policy level, at the, the ground level. But I'm going to start off the discussion by, by asking a very difficult question. And I'm going to ask Elmay to respond to the question first of all. What mandates the European Union? to dictate to other nations of the world how they should produce agricultural crops? It <laughs> might be a very cheeky question, but I think it's a question that we all ask and might be too afraid to ask, Almey. It is a cheeky question, and unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot speak on behalf of the EU, but um, I would like to think that they actually have no mandate. Um, they are seen as a nation that have, um, or European Union, as, an, as a more than one nation, but have the, they're strong in food safety, they're strong in, in technology, and they're building many, many things, and they, they're in the forefront with all of these things, and they come up with a sustainability agenda. And it's something that all of us think of. I mean, us as South Africans also think about sustainability in many other countries. It is the topic that everybody is addressing, but they've now put it forward as a, as a, as a green deal, and now everybody needs to comply with it. Whether they have the mandate to enforce it to other nations, I don't think so, but, <laughs> it's always a but, <laughs> yeah. if uh, we want to export and if you're part of the, the game, then you need to follow what the market requires as well. So in the end, it's sort of this indirect enforcement. Um, I think, and this has been said today, overall, everybody said it, us as South Africans, all the other countries, I hear it from New Zealand, from everywhere, 
are asking the questions, but okay, how is it going to affect us? How do we deal with it? What's the science behind this? All these questions come up. Everybody that I've been talking to and that hear about the Green Deal is, okay, but how are we going to address this? Yes, this is what the EU wants, but how are we going to work around that? So, um, I mean, even within the EU, Belgium and the Netherlands are fighting on a daily basis to, to figure out how they are going to do with it, deal with this. And um, I didn't... Yes, they've put it out there and it, it seems to be coming in eight years' time. They have their first, um, well, already some of the, the plans now, but if we think about the, um, when we need to be organic and when we need to have the limited pesticides use and all of these things, eight years from now we'll have to have these things in place if they succeed in pushing this through. Um, some of the, our European retailer um, members have told us recently that with the war in Ukraine, they probably won't have products in their stores because there's the energy crisis. So it's going to delay some of these deadlines, I'm, I'm sure. And um, things like organic, they've all noticed that there's a decrease in the organic production that they can source from. So even though this is being pushed through by the Green Deal, we see the opposite. So that leads me to, to Paul's presentation, your one slide on all the push and pulls that we have, and everything is contradicting. I mean, it's all the buzzwords, and we, they try to put everything in place, and all of us are trying to make sense of it, but in reality, things are not working according to that plan, it seems like. Um, in other words, you say they, well, we should all accept um, that the EU doesn't have a mandate to dictate to anybody. But <laughs> they set the platform, and what El May says is now, how do we position ourselves to be able to still talk to the platform and service the platform and get our money out of the European Union? But I'm, um, in inverted commas, <laughs> semi-glad to hear that there's discontent in the ranks. In other words, even within the EU, there are companies that say, but we don't want this to happen. And maybe this is something where we need to talk to the advocacy people and say, but how do we pick out those countries and start making connection with them and try and use them as a, as a channel to lobby into the whole European Union and say, but this is not a workable idea. If you don't even have... We spoke today a lot about bundling ourselves together as a front to address the European Union Green Deal. Now, in the European Union, they didn't even have their own total, un total united front. So maybe that's something we should latch on and see how we can negotiate that particular little gap in their own um, approach and maybe use it to our advantage. I don't know whether, Lindy, would you like to respond to that and add on to what El May said about the mandate of the EU and whether the EU is all on the same planet, which I, which I heard now from El May, it's not the same story. They're not really all on the same level with that. Harris, it's not one of the ones that I prep for, but at the same time, it's always difficult in a panel. I think we've all heard all the stories today in the first session, setting the scene, the second session, the challenges we sit with, regulatory issues. And I've always said, I mean, if we really look at what the EU is doing, we all know, if you look at the COP27 that's just taken place, many parties have looked at some elements because we're all having some impact of climate change. But the real issue behind it is EU wants to be the first climate neutral. To the detriment of others, they don't really care. We all know that with regard to them pushing these issues, are they really? We heard today about 19 countries that have put comments forward on two actives. Do they really care what other countries are doing at this stage? Not really. One thing I can say to you, there's nothing to add from what Corbus has said or what Paul has said. We all know these, these things are already having impacts. We know we've had an, an increasing loss of critical actives. It's not the Green Deal that started the process. I already said many years ago this started. There's been an intensified loss of actives mm -hmm. based on the hazard principles. Mm -hmm. South Africa has, in many ways, been able to adapt to using actives. Corbis highlighted a few actives where we can still use products with those changes. The, the reality is we are going to see losses. We're going to see we, we don't have the tools. We, we need new technologies that are going to cost more. 
there's going to be increased cost. And if I look at it at the moment, we heard what Paul said. We've just had a roadshow that Hort Grow's done. And the, the summary of it is that I'm hearing, firstly, some areas have had huge hail losses. Some areas have got farms that are on, on the market, they can't get market prices. Some areas, they're pulling out trees. And when you really look at these issues, it's really about the sustainability at which end. Who carries these costs? It's the growers that are going to carry these costs. They always have. And it's already unsustainable. And the EU is going to continue pushing those issues. We're going to have to find ways around them. Um, the challenge is we don't have the funding, as you've okay, highlighted. One thing you, you said now which interests me a lot is even if we go the route with a good, solid scientific evidence to say but you cannot take the compound off, there's no reason to take it off the market, and we've got the people that do the lobbying and the advocates and stuff, you, still, you tell me that they still don't care. They don't care about what happens with the farm on the ground. Is that what I get from what you said now? Well, I mean, we can see that's the reality that, that Paul and Kubis can comment on that. We've had who is absorbing <coughs> most of these input costs? The grower. The grower mm -hmm. has always been the one that's absorbing increased costs yeah, the to the point that it's not sustainable anymore. Mm -hmm. How long have we had loss of actives? We've had it, it's an ongoing and increasing situation. Mm -hmm. Is the EU taking note of any of the arguments that are being put forward on these issues? Not really. Okay. So, All I right. think that's the reality. I'm not saying we mustn't have a position. I very much think that this is the time, as mm -hmm. I said this morning, for us to work together to try and shape uh, the words that Alan used, yes. what they're trying to do, and to ensure that before we have any trade negotiations where we have things included in our mm -hmm. negotiations that we can't meet, that we can try and shape it. But that's the reality, that's what you are dealing with. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, is Skulk on online? You down there in Lowfeld as far as I know. Hello Skulk, oh, yeah. I can see you. <laughs> Skulk. Oh, yeah. I, I had a bit of a, of a feedback loop and I think it's sorted. Um, what we're discussing now, and you heard what El May said, and you heard what Lindy said, and I would like to know from you, with your engagement with your macadamia farmers on the ground, um, what is your feeling about the EU trying to dictate to us how do we produce that nut on the ground? And do they actually care about what's going to happen to that macadamia producer that might be put out of business if they come with these call them harsh measures. Can, we, can I get your response on that one, please? Gerard, yes, sorry, I was a bit out of the initial bit of the, of the discussion, but um, I, yeah, I have a firm, firm opinion on this one. Um, yeah, I don't think there's, the, you know, at this, at this moment, if you look at the problems facing the macadamia industry, um, most of it is um, due to indigenous uh, insects uh, um, and then also a range of, um, of diseases that, uh, that's fairly unique to our environment. Um, and, and some of these um, some of these restrictions placed on that pl placed by, by the EU uh, on us are really going to make life extremely difficult. Um, with that, I must say that the Mac industry has adopted, um, you know, integrated pest management and all related matters um, in leaps and bounds. Um, the industry has really flown through, you know, through the sort of traditional, um, what's the word, um, succession of, 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 of approaches to crop protection and, and, and at this moment really is grasping the integrated approach. But yeah. I think these things are most certainly going to make it uh, a lot more difficult for our growers, uh, Gerard, if it answers your question. And, 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 um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a lot wider than just the South African growers because um, I, I am just about to leave for Kenya and, um, and it's going to affect the African growers as well. Macadamia is uh, fast becoming a major crop in, uh, in, in Southern Africa, I would say from Kenya down towards the eastern seaboard. So it is really going to affect, uh, uh, um, it is really going to affect growers on a fairly large scale. Okay, Skolk, thanks for that. I want to, I want to keep you on the line there in terms of this, the question I want to latch on to 
the mandate of the EU, and that is um, also maybe a difficult question. The, the producer on the ground, and maybe we should not only say South Africa producer, because Kalk now alluded to other nations in Africa that also impacted by the Green Deal. Um, are these farmers on the ground aware about the Green Deal and what the potential impact is in call it the short to medium term on their sustainability and their livelihoods? Um, or is there the sort of what we call in South African terms the ostrich head in the sand syndrome? So, Skulk, would you like to respond to that? And I'm going to ask um, Paul also, because you are directly in contact with your citrus growers. So, could you maybe respond to that, please, Skulk? Yeah, Gerard, now that's a leading question, if I feel if I've ever heard one. <laughs> um, no, Gerard, um, you know, we, we've been um, trying to communicate, or we're not trying, we have been communicating with our growers for some time now. But my honest opinion is that um, is that they're not aware um, of, of the serious nature of, of what, it, what is coming um, the, during the next few years. Um, you know, um, we've been uh, we've been we've been pressing the IPM and uh, and sustainability button for quite some time, um, and 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 I think dare I say the words so the farmers have become desensitized maybe in in, in some respect. Um, and with all that, I would really like to compliment what you have done today. I really found it extremely insightful, um, and I think it's really, really, really practical stuff that will that will um, that will have a huge impact on on our growers. Gerard, no, um, summarize. I, I don't think the I, I you know despite a lot of effort from our side, I don't think the majority of the growers are totally aware of what's happening. Colk, while you were talking, um, I looked around. My fellow panel members here, and I saw a knot from Elmay and saw a knot from Kurbis, and that's very worrying to me. So I'm going to avoid these two now for the moment and ask Paul, <laughs> because yeah. you are dealing with this massive group of citrus growers. So same question yeah. to you. What is your experience? Yeah, I think it will depend on, on sector, definitely. I think uh, majority probably, I'm talking across the board, aren't, aren't really aware. But it, the, the part of the challenge that I mentioned in my talk is, what do you communicate? You tell them, okay, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, but there's nothing really to, to point to specifically. That, that, that makes it that, that messaging quite, quite mm. difficult, and it's obviously linked to the uncertainty in the whole process. From a, from a fruit point of view, I think we actually have been better off in terms of the broader topics around uh, you, you know, the, the, the farm to fork and, and green deal in the sense like, for example, the confronting climate change, that was started in 2008. It's, it's got 10 years, 12 years worth of more, worth, worth of data sitting there of, of, um, and being able to show evidence. And that, that's a good news story. That's something we can, we can tie in with, with some of our communication. Um, from the citrus industry point of view, um, our board picked up that we needed to focus on this. We brought it to their attention. And we have a strategic plan for the, uh, that's covering four years. So we, we've got a deliberate effort within our organization to communicate around the impacts of uh, the European uh, Green Deal and, and Farm to Fork strategy, and part of that was the development of the Citrus Sustainability Forum, which is we've had a we meet about every quarter, and it started uh, at the beginning of last year. So there, there are deliberate um, attempts to to communicate, and and then within those uh, structures, and obviously now more specifically on citrus, we can start start talking about the the specific aspects of it. I mean, this, this last one last week, uh, Sean were actually gave a whole presentation on integrated pest management and, and, and sort of what was the dynamics around that. So, uh, yeah, from a citrus point of view, I think we, we're doing a, uh, you know, quite a lot. We could probably do more. But, yeah, that's, um, well, I'll leave it for there. Yeah. All right, but now, having listened to your response to this particular difficult question, um, whose fault is it that the farmers are uninformed or disconnected with what's happening in the European Union? Is it, can we lay the blame at the level of the farmer? Is it the grower groups? Is it the level of government? Is it, for example, us a crop life essay? Is it the broader agriculture arena? Um, why, do we, why do we have this particular problem? Who's, who do we pinpoint as saying that you should have started the advocacy to the farm level about this months ago or maybe a year or two ago? I think he's looking Kubis? at you, Kubis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, want the, I, want, I want the guilty part here. I think a very prominent South African, who, and I will refrain from using his name, 
at some stage, one of the richest people in South Africa said to me one day, it's easy to be ethical if you're rich. And then he turned around and he said, I haven't been rich all my life. I think farmers are struggling to a large extent with their budgets. The bottom line is, can they really afford to listen to all this? But so now. And, uh, and in the end of the day, how do they survive? They, in the battle for survival, I've seen many of my own clients uh, across the country battling for survival, driving very nice cars, but I know that the bank would refuse them the next loan to, to buy the packing material. Under those conditions, though, I think the one thing is, and I'm avoiding your question to some extent, but under those conditions, you will find many guys are able to produce fruit with zero residues or with very low residues. And as far as the regulatory side of things are concerned, just ignore the fact that it might not be Global Gap compliant or it might not be Act 36 compliant or whatever. As long as the fruit can be sold, they're very happy to go ahead and do that. And they will continue doing that until specific laws and, and activities come into place which says, sorry, you can't go any further. And I'm not speaking on behalf of farmers. Certainly there are other people, certainly there are a lot of them out there that would follow the rules to a large extent. But those are the ones that are most probably the rich ones or the ones that can afford to do that. The end of the day is who is responsible to carry this message forward? All of us, and we've been sitting here this morning listening, most of us, to new information. All of us would like to reveal this information to our growers and our clients and, and our associates out there. But we are also still in a, in a face of, in a, in a gray area where we don't really know. One might know a lot more than the other and of, of, of each and every bit together. And I think, and that the Skalk has alluded to that, if we get these group together more often, if, if we can get these people to speak about the problems more often, I think there could be a uniform message going out to growers. And as long as you keep on in, uh, informing growers, informing growers, there will be slow but surely changes happening. Mm -hmm. My problem is that the change that is going to happen might be too slow to meet what the regulators are about to do. Because there's, a, there's less than a year, or there's a little bit more than a year left before, if these things come to fruition, a lot of very critical registrations are going to be cancelled, which does not mean you can't use it anymore. It will simply not be available to use anymore. And we don't have suitable alternatives. Mm -hmm. So what are the girls going to do? They will, for the short term, just revert to different markets. But the moment you revert, you put citrus into the eastern or in the far east markets, you start flooding that sensitive markets. Or you go to the Americas, you run into fire sanitary problems and long dispatch times. You go to the UK, well, I don't know. I believe Cyril Ramaphosa has just clinched a deal with the UK government to sell double the amount of wine to them. Maybe they will be so intoxicated that they will suddenly start buying our fruit at a high price. But fact of the matter is, if I look at the arrogance of markets, for instance, not only of the countries, or the, of, the, of, of the regulatory or the authorities, so, so I've recently listened to one of the supermarkets, and I'm involved with many of them in the UK. I've recently listened to one where, where the grower was interrogated by the, by the buyer, saying, I've got this checklist. You tell me how often do you go to the UK. You tell me what uh, uh, status is your, is your aeroplane ticket. Is it, is it business class or is it, is it economic class? If it's business class, why do you fly business class? Where do you live when you're in there? Once you've done, he's completed that checklist of around 20, 25 questions, the, the supermarket will then draw a line and say, okay, your cost of production is this, I will allow you 5% on that. And that was the generous one. And that's it. And he will then di dictate to that grower what price is he going to give, is he going to, to pay him. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's bordering to the, to, on, on, the, on the level of uh, un, in, intolerable uh, that you can dictate to people like that and dictate to growers like that but simultaneously at the time they were doing that they were struggling with eggs on the shelves they didn't have milk on the shelves they didn't have potatoes on the shelves because of their very intelligent Brexit deal and, um, and uh, they were running with trucks standing from here to Timbuktu on the French border they couldn't get the stuff over but yet they were dictating to, to growers on this 
There's a distortion in the world as far as that is concerned. If I now listen to what, what all of you said up until what Kuba said now, it, I get the impression that the farmer is so overburdened with all these regulations and sub-regulations and markets that demand certain things that the farmer might be pulling back um, and going behind the curtain and say, but I just want to be a farmer. I don't want to be cluttered with all this sort of stuff. And that's maybe what happens. And I remember in my young days when I was a student, I used to work on the macadamia farms, banana farms in the, in, in the north, in Lavubu. That was 40 years ago. It was wonderful. You planted your harvest. Now, gee, you've got to be an entomologist. You've got to be a plant pathologist. You've got to be an economist. You've got to be a market player. You've got to have people that are CAs in your company. So now it's farming is not about producing anymore. It becomes a mission to be a farmer. And on top of that, we've got this negative um, perception of farming in the world. So people all want to eat, but they don't like the farmer. So maybe that's why farmers are reluctant to open their ears to the bit of information that we as an audience have been able to get to them. And maybe we should just soften the message and go out again and sort of sensitize it to them that this is something we have to look for because we cannot lose our markets to the European Union or wherever else because my worry is if the EU gets the way it might then follow in the Americas it might then follow on in, in the East but the, the other question which latches onto this is is there currently I'm not talking about future but is there currently a strategy that farmers could deploy um, to overcome the hurdles currently set to us by the European Union and maybe then in the shorter term future when the Green Deal starts to become more of a reality, we know it's a reality, but when it becomes more reality, is there a way that they can currently work with our current complement of plant protection products to overcome that and still use them without jeopardizing the access to market? Lindy, maybe yeah. let's, let's give Lindy a chance. Herrick, I'm going to come in here now because I think we all keep talking EU, but we also heard from Sara's side, thanks Sara, for chairing that work group, that potentially we've got bigger concerns that are going to impact on us within South Africa. So as I tried to say earlier on, we have seen loss of critical actives over the past few years and increasing numbers of critical actives in the EU context. The reality is, over the next two years, we might lose critical actives that we cannot use in South Africa. And what's even more concerning to me is, or not concerning, but I think it's very important that we work collectively to understand what's already on SA growers or what, what impacts the EU Green Deal loss of actives already has on growers, on the ability to produce crops, on the ability to manage key pests and diseases in the case of citrus to manage critical phytosanitary pests, in the case of stone fruit to manage critical phytosanitary pests going to the EU. But also to be cognizant of the fact that if there are going to be phase out of those critical actives, that's going to have even greater impact on the ability to control various pests and diseases in South Africa and to at least have an understanding from a regulatory perspective, yes, there are some actives that will need to be phased out, but at least have an understanding of the need for time to adjust to those requirements before the phase-out is just put on us two years' time with no alternatives on hand to be able to address those concerns. So for me, it's not only about what the EU is doing, it's about what the EU is doing on top of what is going to be happening within South Africa over the next two, three years, which will have even greater impact. As we've already tried to point out, currently, even though products are non-approved for EU use, if products' MRLs drop to limit of quantification or determination at 0.01, we still have an ability. Chlorpyrifos is a very good example. We've still been able to use chlorpyrifos in our dormant applications as a very critical pest, Corbis will be, be able to elaborate. But the fact that it's being phased out, we can't use it anymore in future. And that's, to me, a greater issue that, we, that lies ahead of us, a bigger concern. So for me, it's very important that regulators in South Africa or the registrar also understands potential implications that are going to be on growers. And not only right. that, but as an industry association, you ask 
Do growers know? I think some of us around here have sleepless nights. <laughs> I have sleepless nights when I worry about the loss of potential actives, new diseases. And there's a sort of an expectation created that we can do something that's going to really change the EU. The reality is we can be blue in the face and we won't be able to change what the EU does on some of these things. So there needs to be an understanding going forward that we, we might have to work with loss of critical actives, Quibus, but how we, we can. can try and use a toolbox that allows us to continue producing our crops with available tools in South Africa and with those reduced okay. requirements. I have a thing to add on there, but let me just first see what Paul wants to say, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just two, two points. I think in what we've done in the citrus industry through a parallel process with the, with the forum is linking up with the researchers and actually uh, assessing all our actives and looking what the future looks like and, and trying to anticipate if, if it went, what would be back up and, and, what, you know, and that obviously feeds into more research, etc. We're fairly lucky in the citrus industry, we can, we can really work closely with CRI on that. Um, what worries me a little bit, touching on what you were saying, you know, to what extent is the grower responsible and what can he really do? Um, there's an aspect of this that's worrying me a little bit in the sense that we might find growers trying to do too much, trying to experiment, actually. You know, so you lose an active and now you, 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 you try and one of the consequences of the, of the, the finance, the cheap finance coming out of, of, of Europe is, is a lot of products and a lot of marketing around products being done, even in South Africa, for so-called so more environmentally friendly alternatives, mm -hmm. which either simply don't work or, or they've got other challenges. And you need the robust, sci robust science to actually demonstrate that those aren't actually effective or good options. Mm -hmm. And so there's an aspect of, leaving it up to the grower that worries me because they're not really always in the, in the best position to be making good decisions mm -hmm. and if they're getting um, a lot of uh, things thrown at them from a, a big marketing budget, that, that does worry me quite a lot. Okay, so um, Kobus, give me a second just to put my mind around this. Lindy opened up um, my thought process that yes, there's a a concern about what the EU does because it might affect our exportability to the European Union and maybe the longer term to other markets. But it comes back to what the European Union position is on our own regulatory affairs because it seems to us now, and maybe right for wrong for what I'm saying here, is that the European Union position started influencing the minds of our own regulators to say, but if you have this list of CMRs that are not going to be out of the European Union, we must implement the same policy and regulations in Africa. And that's what Lindy says. Automatically, we, we even without thinking it, adopted the mirror clause by the, from the European Union, which I don't think was ever the intention, but that's the way we, we see it happening at the state level or the government level. And that is, I think, of grave concern. And you mentioned the word claw pretty fast, and, and I learned from Kobus over many years of being associated with them that if you have a problem with an MRL in the European Union, uh, you can work your way around to working with a PHR and so on to still meet the requirement. And you can even say Africa, work your way around to have it here. But what happens if the European Union says chlorpyrifos is out there? It comes back as a murder clause, chlorpyrifos is out in South Africa, which we know has gone out. What does the farmer do? And then Paul says, now automatic you get, and let me use the the nasty term here, the fly by nights coming in with a so-called um, natural or biological or organic remedy that can do the job for you and they market like mad, the farmer buys experiment and the crop fills bitterly and the farmer doesn't even have to export because there's nothing to export. So the farmer are at the mercy of people that fill the gap that's created by a regulatory um, decision uh, where you lose a compound and they come with all these smelly, sniffy stuff that's not peer-reviewed scientifically, that's not proven scientifically, and the farmer starts experimenting and they lose their crop, not even the market, they lose the entire crop. So that is something which we see happening very much in the Western Cape because I get the complaints from my members and farmers and stuff about unregistered stuff. And the unregistered chemical stuff is minimal. The unregistered biologicals, it's cans full. And if you look at the stuff who knows what it is? You don't even know what is on the, on, on the packaging label. And what you don't even know if it's in a container. Who says it's going to work? 
that the farmers are now at the point of being desperate to get a replacement for what they're going to lose and trying to still maintain the market. So this is it's opening up, I think, a new can of worms. But Kovas, you had something to add there. Hello. <coughs> yeah, I, um, just a case, a point in case. One of my clients has got 40 hectares of table grapes. He's been farming that for five years and then abruptly decided he's going to cut it all down and plant tobacco instead. Now, there's an ethical issue about tobacco as well. That's not the, that's not the, core, the, the, the discussion. The reason why he cut it down is he had one year of crop failure, total crop failure, due to the use of a so-called organic program. He was convinced by a, a seller to, uh, to use this program because that will give him better market access. Now, he was ignorant enough to believe that he would have better market access. There's no such a thing. If you've got market access, you've got market access. If you're pregnant, you're pregnant. How much, can you be, how much more can you be pregnant? You, uh, and, the, and the issue was he lost one year of, of, of production, and, that, and he could just simply not survive on that. He, afterwards, he couldn't survive, and he cut the grapes down. That is, that is on the one, one side of things. And I'm, I'm hellish scared that as you both have alluded to, it will open the market for opportunists to proliferate. The regulation on the regulatory side, things are not as tough as on the conventional side chemistry. There are new regulated regulations coming into place, but it's not as tough as on the conventional side. So, and one of the things are, for instance, the toxicology of those things. I mean, you're a toxicologist. Don't tell me that the so-called natural products are not toxic if you want the most toxic substances are natural. If you don't want to believe me, Gaspil met a pof other man. You had seen. And, uh, and, and, and the, the, the problem is that in the end of the day, uh, those chemicals could be extremely toxic. And we don't know. Uh, we don't know what the, what, the, what the residues are of those things. We don't know what the impact on the buyer would be on the end of the day, what the interaction with other chemistry is going to be. Mm. But we, we're drifting far away from your initial question, which says who's responsible and how can we get the grower to know more. Even if the grower knows more, he couldn't do much more. He can only struggle for survival. And I think what we as an industry and as a collective group need are more uh, Ellen whatever's over there that are eloquent, that can speak good English, that knows his stuff, and that can speak directly to authorities. Because it's no good Every, each and every one of us trying to go and convince the, the people on the other side. All that they will do is they will search out the, one, the common denominator that's the weakest link and they will, they will uh, capitalize on that one. If you can come with one message, one story, and a very strong story and a well-informed story, and we all have, an, have, have a responsibility to ensure that that guy goes along with a good story, then we make an impact, and especially if our story is based on good science and facts, not, the, not uh, hocus-pocus ideas, facts. And I cannot emphasize the whole idea of good science enough. You guys are, are very fortunate in the, CR, uh, in the CGA that you've got the CRI at least on one side. We've got universities in the, in the, West, in the, in, in the South, in the Western Cape. We've got Ward Tech, Ward Grow, uh, uh, Lindy. You and your, your team that commissions a lot of good research. And I think in the end of the day, we need to collate that information, make sure that information is well understood, uh, 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 transferred to the growers, and get one message to whoever we use as the lobbyist on the other side. Not with the idea to lobby like the Americans lobby, with the idea to inform. And, and, and I'm pretty sure that the EU is not that draconic. Yes, there's a strong element of, of, of of politics involved, but I don't think it's entirely draconically decision-making and uniform decision-making. Yes, they are inclusive to a large extent, but Alan, I'm pretty sure you will agree that if you come with a good message, and I've found it often in the past, if you come with a good message, they will listen, because 99% of the time then that you have a distortion, it's because of lack of information. Okay, Kubis. So you come again with two messages. The one message is to get everybody together to talk the same language with the same message. But on top of that, you latched onto Alan now 
and get the right person to transfer the message. In other words, if all of us decide we have the same, we have the same sort of plate of food to offer the European Union, but we all go individually, it's not the right approach. We must all put together one food basket and give it to one person to go and dish up at the European Union. And that's why I think in the future we might need to get much closer to a proper advocacy person like, like Alan to talk on behalf of the entire South African agriculturina and not go one, two, three, four and go and try and influence the European Union and do it that way. But um, I also got from you now, Quirvis, and from the others around the, the, the floor now that there's not much the farmer can do because if we lose a particular product, what can the farmer do? That thing is completely gone. And I'm sad to say, back in my younger days, in the year 2002, I got a real bee in my bonnet about monochlorophos, and I lobbied like mad to get it off the market. But we had a four-year strategy, in other words, to look at phasing it out and bring something in behind it. And unfortunately now, it's not the norm anymore. Now it's a case of you lose it, and us as the state or the government don't allow anything behind it because we don't have the capacity to regulate properly, we don't have um, enough staff to evaluate new technology behind it, so we're in a, a different sort of playing field at, at the present. So the poor farmer, wherever he or she is in, in Africa for that matter, other places in the world, is left without a strategy to, go, to overcome this nasty thing of the EU which reflects back on South Africa and say, but if the EU says that, we will do it the same year. So we are in a real problem. But it leads me on to my fourth question. We've gone now from a policy level to a group level to the individual farmer. What about the person who eats the food? How will all of this influence the consumer who relies on that farm on the ground producing the max or the citrus or the wheat, whatever? How will it influence my ability to still have a sustainable and affordable and a safe food source? Anybody would like to respond I, to that? I think, you must, I think you must just ask the ones that are hungry. Pardon? I see, if you ask the people that are hungry, they will ignore whatever uh, embargo you put on the product and the safety and all of that stuff. They will bloody will eat to their fill. I think, to a large extent, our first world consumer have become, uh, is a wealthy consumer. It's to a large extent, the, the guys that are willing to pay a lot of money for produce are wealthy consumers, so they have got a lot of choice, so they've got a lot of opinions. Many of those opinions are not science-based. It's pseudoscience, it's driven by, by, it's absolutely driven by so-called consumer watchdogs. If I look at the German supermarkets, I'm convinced that 80% of the decision-making that takes place and the distortion in the German supermarkets are driven by consumer watchdogs, not by science. So, but if you are really hungry, would you listen to a pseudoscientist? Or you just get what you eat? Can you take what you get? Yeah, okay, but you might not, you might not as a consumer listen to the serious scientists. My worry is, me as a normal consumer, irrespective of your cultural background or your, or your economic level, will I still be able to get the food required to keep myself my family going? That is the big question. If you have these, uh, all these rules that we're talking about, you might, you might run out of food at some stage. You might run out of the selection of produce. You might, in the end of the day, have only who said to it, you must eat less meat and less vegetables, and, and I'm very happy about that because that would mean that the, the meat will get cheaper and the vegetables more expensive. So I'll go for the cheapest stuff. No, somebody around the table <laughs> said that this afternoon. It's not my okay. idea. But, but, me, uh, but I just want to, uh, there might be a question for four minutes. Just ask El May, with you, all your contacts and your connections across, across the globe, do you see places where there's already a food shortage at the consumer level because of the possible influence of the Green Deal concept and flowing down to regulatory affairs in, at, at, at the, a national level? Not really. I think the consumer isn't really aware of any of these things. Um, <laughs> I tend to agree here with Kubis in terms of the consumer watchdogs that uh, they put the ideas into the heads of the retailers on what is it that the consumer wants. I mean, we've discussed many times with them, but what is it that the consumer really wants? We update our standards, we look into legislations, we do all these things, 
talking about sustainability now all the time, but what is it that you really need? What is it that... I mean, we, we build the standards based on what the retailers want and what the producers can do, deliver, auditable, all the, all the practicalities behind that. But if we ask the retailers, okay, but what is it that you need? They say, oh, the, the producer, the, sorry, the consumers want this and this and this. Like, okay, do you have surveys? Do you, how do you know that this is what they want? And it's driven by certain agendas. We know that. Um, I don't think the consumers are... And yes, they will see shortages in places on foods being available. As I mentioned before, they, things will change. And but the one thing that we don't know is whether a retailer will be so adamant to say, OK, I will have an empty shelf because I cannot get something that is legally produced or safely produced or whatever, hopefully safe. I, yeah. I, I always think I, I, we should I have think, safe food, yeah, right? I think we should eliminate that. <laughs> That's not debatable, <laughs> yeah. I agree. Yeah. But I mean, whether it's with X, Y and Z and all the requirements that's coming into place, whether they just want the safe food basically there. So, yeah, it's mm. a debatable question. Mm. Herod, I, s I saw a very a good example of that, let's say 20 years ago, because if it's when before Toyota dominated the market, if you go to Springbok, you would find everybody driving around a Land Rover. If you go to Uppington, you will find them driving Fords. And the only reason for that dichotomy is that you've got a bloody good salesman in, in, in Springbok, and you've got a better one on Fords in, in, in Uppington. The net effect is, is exactly what Elmi is saying, Consumers eat what the supermarkets give them, mm. and they have maybe a little bit of choice of their own. But if you have one supermarket dominating a particular environment and area, those are the ones that dictate the pace. And those are the ones that look at the German supermarkets. I mean, it's a competition between the German supermarkets with less and less and less MRLs, less and less residues. If you go to the UK, they don't bother a bit. Yeah, they talk about these things, but the consumers are not so concerned. Even the Lidl's in the UK differ from the Lidl's in, in, uh, in Germany and in Holland. Mm, okay. So I think to a large extent, it's a competitive environment where, com where supermarkets compete with one another on the basis of food safety, which is ridiculous. In, a, yeah. in, a, in an area or in an era when we have when we talk about food shortages and we talk about waste and we talk about expensiveness, we are still basing our competitive advantage on sensitive, perceptive issues like food safety. I mean, again, you're a toxic toxicologist. How much safer can the food be after it's gone through 17, 18, 20 top-grade toxicologists in EFSA? And the MRLs are being set, the RFDs are being set, everything is being set but now you want to reduce it with, one, with two thirds to only one third of the MRL. Yeah. Well, I can tell you from a toxicological perspective, uh, looking at the human population development over the world, if our food was so, so unsafe, why did we hit the eight billion mark of the human population in the world a week or two ago? And we know that they talk about 2025, we're gonna hit 8.5 billion. So if the food was so unsafe, why do we see this escalation in human population? There's something which doesn't gel in the entire argument. And I agree with what El May said, and I agree with what Quiver said, and I even do my own presentation to students that this whole thing is not science-driven. It is market-driven. So the market tells the people, tells less, this is what you should eat because it is safer for you. But they give you a 20% markup on it because I tell you it's safer. So there's a conditioning of the consumer, and then the market used to say, but our consumers want this. No, the consumer wants something which is edible, affordable, safe, and tasty. They don't worry about whether there's 0 0.001 ppm or 4.01 ppm or stuff, as long as it is affordable. And unfortunately, I think the economics dictate the market. But before I talk too much, there was there a question or an input from the floor? Ben Croft, can somebody please bond? Pause Ben, if you've got one, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Just give it some power there, please. Hello, yeah. Thank you, Gerard. Um, yes, I think we must just maybe be uh, careful to generalize. You know, it's, if and when there is pressure on our critical chemical compounds, 
We will have to look broader for alternative crop protection solutions in our IPM programs. As an example, there are biological and biorational products that's been uh, scientific peer reviewed. And um, I'm just feeling that uh, um, we must rather work together than against each other. Uh, because I think the future, there's a lot of opportunities in you know, investigation into the biological and biorational solutions. So I'm just feeling that we must, mustn't say they are they or us or the chemicals versus the biologicals. But I do agree with you, Gerard, on the, there's a lot of, um, there's some sort of biological companies within South Africa that's taking the shortcuts, using the M registrations and making L registration claims. I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of work to be done there. And that's why mm -hmm. within CropLife, we've got now the Biological Forum to get more companies on board to state their case going forward. Thank you, Ben. I think it's good that you brought up this topic of biological versus biological. Now, in crop life, we've always had the policy or position that to us, as crop life South Africa, um, there's no difference between a synthetic chemical, a natural chemical, a natural plant extract remedy, or a biological. They all serve the purpose of assisting the farmer to produce the crop safely and affordably. But we've had an issue with this idea that biologicals or organics are safer. It's not the case. And listen to what Kuba says, and I don't want to give you a lecture on toxicology now because it's not the platform. But we maintain the policy that when you want to put a biological in the market, it has to go through the same fine sieve as what you do for a pesticide. There might be a reason to ask for an exemption on certain toxicological data or residue data because it's biological, but don't come to me as a toxicologist or to crop life for that matter and say, but I got a biological, it's safe, let's go for them, let's go into the market. It cannot be. And I'm proud to say that in South Africa, within crop life, we have a lot of members, like for example, Ben from one of our member companies, that focus on biological remedies, that go through extensive research, and they take up to seven years before they get the product ready for the market, then go through the typical regulated process that anything like a chlorpyrifos would have to go through. And the farmers can trust it because it's been proven, it's been scientifically established, it can do the job in an IPM program. So, Ben, I think that's a good thing to, to put that into the um, discussion. Maybe the last... Uh, was just before Ben gets off the hook, he was correctly referring to biologicals and biorationals, and I referred to that in the speech myself. Ben had you mooi geluisterd, het so you geluisterd, ek het in goede trou daarover gepraat. Fact is, simultaneously referring to, let's say, weaker biologicals, we should also refer to weaker con conventional compounds. There are many guys that go, that jump through the, there are many products at this point in time and there are many practices in this point in time that is absolutely horrifying. Yesterday, I listened, listened to a grower which compared two spray programs on potatoes. The one was working well on potato tuber moth, and the other one was not working that well on potato tuber moth. The one that was not working well was following, a, a, let's say, a traditional approach towards uh, potato tuber moth control. The one that was working well had 11 sprays of the same compound applied 11 times after each other. And it, it is absolutely horrifying to think that that grower of that individual that had made that recommendation would totally screw up the whole concept of, of resistance and would put the farmer out of an opportunity to repeat that thing again and plant potatoes there again. There are many, many examples of that. There are also, unfortunately, fewer but examples of opportunists in the biorational, biological environment. And I'm proud to say that there are also many very good biological companies out there bringing stuff to the market. And it is a pity that they too are being subjected to lengthy, lengthy uh, uh, evaluation processes. We need those products as much as we need the conventionals. And I was alluding to it, maybe in the form of replacements, but also in the form of hybrids which in the nearby future could, could serve as well by reducing residues or even eliminating residues. And the, the problem is exactly the same as with our conventional products. You can't necessarily always believe the trial results. 
and I'm saying that with, with, with apprehension. Thank you, Corbus, and thank you, Ben. A last question to El May, a 30-second response. Um, we have Global Gap, been around for ages. So Global Gap, from my personal perspective, we're not talking about half a crop like this, you know, has established a platform for good agricultural practice, sound and effective and safe use of pesticides. Why do we still need another regulator out there? Why do we need another EU Green Deal? Why do we need, I don't want to go to all these things, farming for the future, all these things, <coughs> the Rainforest Alliance, where you farm in Milikaroo, what the hell has got the Rainforest Alliance doing there? <laughs> do we still, do we really need an additional level of control above the platform that was established by Global Gap? Elme, you can give me a personal opinion or a Global Gap opinion. I think it's the same one. Um, <laughs> Gerard, that is difficult to answer, and I think the answer lies in the fact that you're not the one deciding what's needed. Um, there's competition out there, so we're just a standard setter. Yes, I also believe we have a good standard that covers sort of everything. We're a global standard, therefore we need to be generic. We want to be science-based, we want to be risk-based um, risk and outcome-based. So that producers, doesn't matter if they're in South Africa, Kenya, China, Europe, wherever, that they can produce safe food in a sustainable way, but in the way that is logical and practical and pragmatic in their environment. That is our ultimate aim and goal. So for me, that makes perfect sense, and I don't understand why there are more standards out there, but there are, and this is because retailers want to be individuals, they want to have things on top, because they, they all want to have that, that unique selling point or something. And um, it, it's just a matter of competition and everybody wants to have a say somewhere in life to make a point. <laughs> okay. so that's Thank my personal much. opinion part. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but All right. I would, sorry, I would like to say, we said before that there's not much producers can do in this whole thing. Yes, to some, it's very true. But I do think we still have an obligation. I would love it if Crop Life can take some role in that for education and communication to producers to understand not necessarily the Green Deal and all the, big, the bigger picture mm. things, but the reasons why, what is um, resistance building, what is IPM? Yes, they know little bits and pieces of it, but in the case that you just mentioned, the producer, why does he even think that applying a, one chemical seven times would be a good thing? Does he ask the right questions to the suppliers? Ben is doing a good job, the next guy is doing a bad job, but much cheaper, so the producers just go for the cheap option. Mm. Sorry, I'm generalizing, I'm calling out names, but <laughs> this is the reality. The farmers also just gonna go for the cheapest way out because things get more expensive, more difficult, there's more things to comply with. I think there's a huge, huge opportunity for us to, to educate and communicate. Thank you. Well, one of the pillars of crop life is a is actually to influence people and to educate people. Maybe the word educate might sound a bit harsh on the other farmer, but we rather talk about that um, awareness, creating awareness, and the word that we got from Alan today, that, that advocacy. So advocacy is not only aimed at states and governments and EU, it's also aimed at the farmer, advocate what is good agricultural practice and so on. So on that note, Thank you, Almay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Kubis. Thank you, Lindy. I think it was a fruitful discussion. And thank you, Ben, for putting that last comment in. Folks, I'm going to step off the podium now Skull. and hand back over to Rod to do the conclusion for the day. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and to, and to Gerard. So uh, I just want to run through a few notes that I've taken during the course of today just to, to reinforce a few things. Uh, and bring us back to, to why we started off here today is talking about the EU Green Deal. So um, I think the, the first thing I want to share is some of the key points I took out of Samira's uh, presentation to us, uh, who opened up our, our session. Uh, and I think some of the key points there are African farmers need to do more and we need to do it together. Uh, we've heard that numerous times. We need to get one voice going up to the European Union uh, and the African Union uh, expressing the concerns we have. Um, Almay, we're very happy to hear that your, 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 recent, your last comment about um, 
maybe crop life playing a facilitatory role because we had the same from Samira in the beginning. She's volunteered that she's there with her organization to assist Crop Life South Africa uh, in uh, taking these messages uh, uh, up the line. You also heard uh, Samira talking about the green transition for Africa. It, it might have slipped under the radar, but this is really a, a first step. If the European Union can want to have it, why can't Africa? And it's a, it's a very noble cause, and this is one of the first you're going to hear about it from CropLife about the uh, green transition for, for Africa. Uh, I think the next point, if I don't go all the way to the end of my notes, sorry for that. Um, we had Dr. Matthews. I thought um, his overview of the EU Green Deal and the various parts was excellent. <clears throat> Remember, he told us he's got the three platforms to it, the environmental, the economic, and the social. Uh, also highlighted that there are multiple other uh, EU uh, regulations and legislation that are going to have an impact. And he introduced to us the, the, the mirror clause uh, uh, concept. And he's also introduced that there the concept that there could be both positive and negative uh, impacts of the Green Deal. Uh, Dr. Davids from, from BFAP gave us some great data as to how important the European Union is for our export farmers. Uh, and for me, that just shows we have to take a stand. We have to have some form of action uh, going back up because of the importance of uh, the EU as a trading partner. Uh, and Tracy also highlighted again that there will be opportunities. Just the challenges, will we be able to uh, navigate the regulatory hurdles to take advantage of those, uh, those challenges? Um, then Vipka spoke to us about the MRLs. Uh, for me, the key to take out of this is the objection that's already been made of linking environmental factors to the setting of MRLs. Environmental factors are already taken into account when the active ingredient uh, is analysed or assessed, and also when the formulated product is assessed. So, so why does the EU want to link those together? Uh, I think that's important. Uh, the bit that I tried to highlight in, in my presentation, I think is, is also where Lindy's been highlighting, is yes, our primary focus of today and, and going forward has been the EU Green Deal, but let's not forget that there are other regulatory hurdles that we already have. EU Green Deal is just going to exasperate other challenges we have, but we do need to take into account that there are other uh, internal, external uh, regulatory influences. The second session we had today uh, was, um, again, led us into it with, uh, with looking at uh, other regulatory challenges. It was Sara with the um, update from the fantastic work that she and the working group have been doing on the 1As and 1Bs. I think you all know where we are now in the process and uh, grower associations as well as CropLife South Africa members have received the, the updates as to where we are and we will keep everybody posted going forward. Uh, Prof. Juster gave a pretty good overview there, I thought, of uh, potential economic as aspects of policies that they can have on, on agriculture. Uh, but a key takeaway for me is something we discussed at our EXCO yesterday, uh, is the vast number of other bits of legislation that are impacting uh, our industry. So it was good to see it coming in, in, in Prof. Eusta's uh, presentation, because we've already highlighted as something we need to help share to our members. It's not just Act 36. There's lots of other legislation. Uh, Sabu Kamalo um, restored my faith in interaction um, with people who we often think might be barriers to our trade or, or barriers to our industry. So our experience in the very recent past of, ex of expressing our concerns about the uh, EU notification of revoking certain MRLs for a couple of active ingredients. Um, DTRC embraced us, listened to us, and took our message up to the European Union, and uh, Cebu gave us a great feedback on where we are there. The reason I'm highlighting that is, going forward, we are going to have to engage with multiple role players in, in our industry to get our voice heard, and having DTRC as a valued partner there is going to be critical to us going forward. So, Great f uh, um, uh, foundation has been set. Um, we're very pleased that Alan could jump on the plane and get down here because uh, uh, you can all see from what's been discussed today, if we're not speaking one voice and we're not speaking to the right people, we're going to get nowhere. So advocacy is going to be key to us going forward. Uh, and we look forward to, to getting guidance from Alan. The key message there is we need collaboration. Again, it's a common theme. All role players need to be involved. And we need to start now. 
So uh, we can't wait another two years to, to start looking at this, pretty much like we decided with the 1As and 1Bs. We can't wait any longer. We need to take some action ourselves. So we look forward to your guidance and collaboration there, Alan. Thank you. Then this final session chaired by, by Gerard and with our panelists um, is what's going to happen on the ground? Can we get some, some pointers or some feel as to, as to what's coming? Um, so I really appreciate the... Uh, the, uh, the overview that um, Kuba started in terms of what should an ideal spray, spray program have or a, a pest control um, uh, activity on the farm. It needs to be effective and uh, we, we, we ran, Kuba's ran through with us those key points. Also to illustrate the dangers of losing certain active ingredients, uh, Kuba uh, showed us uh, a short list of, of 1B products and then did a deep dive into two of them. Uh, and that is exactly what the uh, working group, the 1A, 1B working group has been doing and exactly what the working group reached out to the various grower associations to continue the work. Have a look at the preliminary, preliminary list and I highlight it's preliminary. Um, not everyone has finished their GHS classifications yet, so uh, wait for the final work please. Don't, don't get yourselves worked up with what you saw but it is exactly what we have been doing and it is exactly what we have to continue to do uh, to come up with our, our scientific-based data as to why we would need some of these uh, molecules to, to stay around. Paul then gave us a, a, an awesome presentation and the key for me was highlighting, Paul, that there are no trade policies or much legislation these days that don't have a political angle to it, which is, uh, which is concerning, but it also is going to help guide us going forward. Uh, we can't go in with the emotional fluffy feel that uh, we can't do without it. We have to go in and explain exactly why we can't do without an active ingredient. And Paul also highlighted a, another common factor that's been going through a few of the presentations this afternoon, is decisions need to be based on sound scientific generated data. It cannot just be on emotions or because we want to, want to save the planet. Um, we get this all the time. I, we have a a misconception that people in the in the agricultural industry don't care about the environment, but uh, I can tell you, like me, there's lots of us bunny huggers out there. So it is a perception that we also need to overcome with our strategy going forward. The panel discussion was interesting. Uh, um, no offence, I think we went off the green deal a little bit at the end, but it's very valuable points that that we all going to we all going to um, take to heart. But the, the key point that I did take from it is. As we lose molecules and farmers are losing plant protection solutions, uh, there is the risk that they're going to start going off-label or unregistered products or products that haven't been tested or, or their own tank mixture because Wim um, Paul next door tells them it works. So it's something as an industry, as a grower association, uh, our members are, are registration holders. We need to be cognizant so we could have that risk going forward. Then the conclusions from my side, again, Elmay, thank you for raising it. Uh, CropLife does not want to take ownership of this process. It does not belong to us. It belongs to all role players. However, we do believe we have some experience. We have expertise with uh, advocacy, and we certainly would like to play a facilitatory role. So anybody out there who wants to hold hands and walk with us, if you've got ideas that weren't shared today, you know who we are. So please either go through your grower association or come directly to us, share your ideas. And if you're willing to put in some hard graft as well, we, all, all, all comers will be certainly welcome. Um, there was also a question asked and, and Elmay answered it. Um, yes, I agree. I think communications to growers is certainly going to be one of the responsibilities of the Crop Life Association. It's our members who are going to be motivating to keep some of these molecules on the market. Uh, and I do believe uh, in conjunction with grower associations, we need to reach out to, we need to, reach out to the farmers. Uh, and then finally, I would just like to extend our thanks to all of you, not only for being here today, uh, but for showing that um, uh, there was a reason for this, for this session to happen today. And I thank you in advance because I'm hoping that you're all going to come up with some wonderful ideas that you can feed back into, into the creation of the strategy as to how we can approach the European Union uh, to try and get them to see uh, there could be some unintended consequences of their policies and can we mitigate those potential unintended uh, consequences via interaction with them. Those of you who have hung in there and joined us virtually, 
We thank you for, for joining us today. And for those of you in the room, if you have the time, please join us for some refreshments and networking afterwards. Sincere thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank you.